Harris? Man, that's a great question. And first and foremost, man, I just want to uh, uh, tell you how much I appreciate this this moment and opportunity to talk to the people that are close to you and, and welcome everybody that you have on the Zoom. I can see uh, some of the people on, so welcome to all of you. Um, but my morning, my morning routine, essentially, <laughs> it was the same every single day for the past probably 15 years. And it's changed up to this point right now, but when I was playing, I would wake up at about five, I would pray and I would meditate, and I would visualize. And it, it didn't matter if it was practice, it didn't matter if it was a game, it was the same thing every single day. And I believe that <clears throat> those habits that I created in the morning propelled me to have the success that I had in, um, in football. That's the reason why I was able to get the slight edge over people because I was locked in every single day. I have more so like the Kobe Bryant mentality. I go to work every day to work. It's not it's not play. It's, it's to work. And I love my job, and I love it more than anything. Nice, nice. Um, what what does what does being a former athlete, um, or sorry, how does how does being a former athlete make you a better person? And that's a great question. Well, first off. Um, it makes me a better person because I understand what it takes to 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 become the the or reach the, the level of success that a lot of people dream of reaching. Um, but on the flip, I know exactly where to show grace because as high as I was able to, to reach, um, the faster the fall was for me as well. And so I've been to a place where I've been extremely successful, but then also I've been to a place where I've been extremely humble. And so it was, it's, it's, it's a situation where I can identify with everybody. There's people in their, in their lives that have had successes, but there's also people in their lives that have had failures. And so for me, I can identify with every spectrum of a person that, uh, that's dealing with something. And so I can see it from any vantage point uh, um, from success and from, from failure. That's, that's funny you said that, because I experienced that as well, uh, being an entrepreneur owning my business. Things will, will come up, you know, dramatically, and things will be going very well. You'll have a lot of sales. You'll do a lot of different things, and then all of a sudden, then everything comes crashing down, and the dominoes fall. And so I, it's crazy that you know, being an entrepreneur as well as an athlete, it's this, it's almost the same uh, type of success in terms of there's there's great moments, and then there's you know there's really bad falls. So I, I like that uh, you know, the two relate. Um, what was something that you did to reflect after a good performance? Well, first off, um, I enjoyed the moment of a good performance for a certain amount of time. That's one because because um, that's something that you got to do because a lot of times a lot of people don't enjoy their successes even though it was only for a short amount of time. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed the success um, for a short amount of time. And then what I did is I watched film. I watched a lot of film. And when I watched the film, I could see what I needed to improve on. And so my biggest thing was figuring out where I need to improve, even though I had a lot of uh, a high level of success at that moment. I needed to know where I could get better. So the next day, I put the success behind me so I could get the work immediately so I could be better. And, and so how did you deal with pressure? Because it seems like, like that's definitely a big component of that. I mean, when you've done it for such a long time and you've been in every situation that you could potentially be in when it came to um, the game, there was no pressure. You know what I'm saying? Like, there was no pressure. Because, you know, the way I grew up, um, and I'm sure a lot of people can attest to this for yourself, I'm sure that the way that you grew up, there was some – some things, there were some struggles in your life that would would basically uh, help mold and shape you to the person that you are now. And so pressure was when I came home um, with my mom and, and some certain situations wasn't right. I didn't feel pressure when it came to sports. I just did my job. You know what I'm saying? So dealing with pressure really, I, did, I never felt like I had to deal with pressure in a football game because it was a game. You know what I'm saying? It, but... I would say I would probably say more than anything. Um, I was prepared, so 
there was no pressure. As long as you prepare, you know exactly what you need to do. I didn't feel it. So let me ask you a better question then. How do you deal with pressure either right now in your family situation or how did you deal with pressure, you know, living with your mom, right? How did you deal with pressure when the football feels easy, right, in terms of not necessarily easy, but it, it is almost like a break from real life. But how do you deal with real life pressure then? That's a great question. Um, honestly, I've, I've always been a, a very high achiever. So, you know, ultimately, I, I would put things in perspective of sports 100% of the time, right? So when you ask how I deal with pressure, it's more so understanding that there's always good things that come if you think that there are. So my mindset would always was would always be fixed on what the positive outcome could be or how I could make the situation better. If there's a situation that I just can't control, which brings a lot of anxiety and pressure to people, I wouldn't worry about it. The only thing that I could potentially control is my the way that I responded to a situation or what I did in the situation. And so as long as I controlled the controllable, it didn't matter what was going on around me. I just kept the calm head and I always thought positive. So the, the short answer to that would be my mindset was fixed on what I could do better and also how to how to control the things that I could control. Pressure is only a situation when you allow it to be. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, That's a cool a concept. Question from Jay. Uh, what are some things you did to pick yourself back up after being humbled? Ooh, ooh, that's, a, ooh, that's a good one. So, Jay, look. I'm gonna be honest with you, bro. Like, uh, there were some games that I had that were bad, um, and and really the biggest thing was I would have a short memory as to what I did wrong, but the thing, like doing it wrong, but the thing that I did was I realized and understood that the only way that I got better is if I didn't make that same mistake. So picking myself up is a lot of self-talk. A lot of people don't understand that the voice that you hear in your head the most is yourself and the, and, the, and, the, and the Holy Spirit. And so I really made sure that for me, if I was going to be talking to myself consistently, which everybody does regardless, I was going to put the most positive things into my mind that I could so that, so that regardless of what the outside noise was, especially when I was playing in the league and I played for the Rams and we were bad. And so, you know, the, the, the beat writers and reporters would say so much negative things about me, my teammates, and everything like that. At some point, it's just like, I'm not going to believe your lie. You're not going to convince me that I'm as bad as you say I am. I know that I'm not. I know that I'm not. So humbling is reading an article about you dropping passes when you've caught every single pass up to this point in the game. Like, it just mm. doesn't make any sense. That's it's interesting. Like, why are you talking this bad about me? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so um, I would have to say that my main thing was understanding what they said about me wasn't wasn't valid and not internalizing somebody else's feelings about me. Because it is humbling when people are saying negative things when you've always heard people saying positive things about them. Um, and guys, feel free to, to type in any questions um, in the chat so we can, we can ask Mr. Burton. And if you guys need any insight, um, and, and you want, you know, a different perspective on life, especially from a professional athlete, um, you know, a former professional athlete, go ahead and type it in there. And all uh, as soon as we kind of finish up on one question, then we'll get moving on the next one. Um, so what, what then was the best part of competition for you? Like what, what is that, what does competition mean for you? Man, you're bringing the heat. Listen, so competition is never, it has never been about the person. Competition is the person that I stare in the mirror at every single day. And every day I realize that if I could beat the person in the mirror, that I would win, right? So, see, a lot of people have this thought process that they're competing with the person next to them. I'm competing with the person that I need to become tomorrow. I'm competing with the person that I need to beat tomorrow. And so my definition of competition is basically beating oneself consistently over time to achieve a goal and dream that you choose to, that you that you want for yourself. Mm -hmm. And and like, you know, I was told a long time.
time ago by my father that, that practice is the hardest part of the game. And the reason why is because you dream of running out the tunnel in an NFL game uh, when you're younger. You dream of running out the tunnel in a college, a collegiate game when you're younger. You dream about, you know, in high school, all the girls, you know, going crazy when you run out of the tunnel. The game is the funnest part. The hardest part about competition is practice, is the process. And that's something that I love. So to answer your question, competition is beating the person that you stare at every day. And that's, your, that's yourself. It's yourself. You can beat the person in the mirror. You can beat anybody in front of you 100% of the time because you can outwork them. Got another question from iPad. <laughs> uh, why do you believe that waking up at 5 a.m. gave you an advantage over others waking up later? Oh, that okay. Okay, well, iPad, let me just say this right now. <laughs> because I understood that that one, when I was when I was training, a lot of athletes are not, unless you're Kobe Bryant now which rest in peace, and that's my guy. But a lot of athletes don't like the grind. They don't. They do not like the grind. They do not like the process. And I understood that if I could get up actually and, and go run hills at 4.30 or 5 o'clock, go work out at 5, 5.45, um, and then by midday be able to work on my route, be able to work with my quarterback, and then at night lift, lift weights again, I, I was putting in – than a person was that was getting up at 8 or 9 o'clock because they went out the night before. See, in college, I never went out. Not during the season. I never went out. When I was young, I never cheated. So, so being able to have a consistent work ethic over a certain amount of time put me in a position to be not necessarily better but more prepared than the person that was getting up at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. If you're getting up at 7, I'll beat you. I've been up for two hours, two and a half hours already. I've, I've already been up. So I knew that I may not be the strongest, I may not be the fastest, I may not be the biggest, but one thing I was was the most consistent and you were not going to out-effort me. You were not going to out-eat me. That was not happening. So the only way that you can do that, because there's only 24 hours in a day, the only way that you could possibly do that is by getting up before people. If I knew you was getting up at 4 o'clock, I'm getting up at 3.30. I'm going to have at least 30, 30, 30 minutes over you beating me. Now, you're not going to win. I'm going to win that by uh, every time. Um, what did you do to build confidence? I mean, it sounds like that question, I mean, that response there, like that's what you did to build confidence. But I'm going to ask the question anyways. What did you do to build confidence and what did it do to your overall success? So confidence comes from self-talk every time. See, here's the problem. The problem is a lot of people believe the, 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 the voice of doubt in their head and that's what chips at your confidence every day. That's the, pro that's the problem. So I knew for a fact that if I, if I lied to myself enough, I would start to believe it. I wasn't even a receiver when I went to college. I was a quarterback. I was a safety. So I told myself that I wanted the top receivers in the SEC even before I stepped foot on campus. I told myself who I was going to be before I became the person that I knew I was going to be. The way that you build confidence in anything, I don't care if it's in business, I don't care if it's in sports, I don't care if it's in your everyday life, the way that you build confidence is you have to lie to yourself to tell yourself every single day who you are. For instance, give me one second. <laughs> Y'all may not be able to see Y'all may not be able to see this, but these are these are my affirmations. Y'all not gonna be able to read them, but these are my affirmations every day that I read to myself that I lie to myself about. And so some of them, I am strong, I am the leader, I am, I am a grower, I have value to everything I touch, I am confident. All of these different things on this board get put into my subconscious mind every single day. I didn't start doing this when I stopped playing football. I've been doing this since I was about 15 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm the best running back in the state, I'm the best receiver in the state, I'm the best, I'm the best quarterback in the state, I'm the best athlete. That didn't just, happen. That didn't just start. It's my self-talk. You build confidence with the belief that you have in yourself. And nothing else, because nobody's going to believe in you like yourself and or God or my mama, because my mom loves me. So she believes in me more than I believe in myself. I see. Um, sorry, we're having, we're trying to get this screen recorded here. So, so one second. Are you recording this? <laughs> it took your time. Are you recording this? No, but I can. Let me go ahead. Let me go ahead and do this right now. Can you record from here? Because I can't figure it out on my end.
I got it. I got it. You good? Okay. Um, here's a question from. So we got J iPad Billy. Um, Billy. Okay. The trans the transition from injury on a life dream. He, he, he's asking, and how did you work through it to make a change? So Billy's asking a very very tough question because that's a consistent battle. Okay, um, which is a great question, Billy. But when you have something that you that you let me say this first to everybody. Football was everything to me. My wife can attest to it. She's in the kitchen right now. She should be checking my wings, but she's not. <laughs> but, uh, but my wife was there for the good, and she was there for the, the horrible, the bad, right? And I didn't adjust to losing my career through injury well at all. I didn't. When I got injured, I felt like a failure, and I felt like I had let my family down because I felt like football was the vehicle that I was going to use to save everybody. We grew up in poverty. You know what I'm saying? We grew up, it was it was bad. My dad did the best that he could, come from a split household. My mom did the best that they could. They worked three jobs each to, just, just to try to make ends meet and, and ends still didn't meet. You know what I'm saying? Like, my mom and dad were extremely hard, and I think that's where I did my work ethic from. But um, I had to do a lot of praying, and I had to do a lot of reading. Um, I had to build my self-confidence back up, and I had to build my identity into something different than I, it was before because I was a I was an NFL football player, so that was who I was, and I didn't know that that wasn't going to be enough when it was over because I, I never prepared for it. Um, I thought I would be playing 10, 12 plus years and making millions of dollars playing football, and that just wasn't the case. I felt like I would be in a four or five million dollar mansion driving a Rolls Royce everywhere I went, and it didn't happen. And so um, I had to really dig deep down inside of myself. Uh, and use my family God and most importantly outside of God use my wife to help me rebuild my stuff because if she hadn't believed in me I don't know where I would be at so more so it was about the books that I read and the mindset that I had to take on and just to realize that the, 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 the dream was over and so when because the injury is what ended my career so once I realized that I started to really think about okay what's next and put a plan together about what's next with some business ventures and also with the help of my wife um it, it kind of happened for me. And then I had to find a way to put myself in an avenue that basically took my attention and my mind off of losing my career and hopefully producing income in that avenue. Hmm. Um, speaking of books, we're going to we're gonna kind of segue into, um, you, you know, you're in my favorite book, The 5 a.m. Club. Uh, what, what is your personal definition of serenity? I, I would probably say, I would probably say the definition of it is peace, freedom. Uh, but your own, like, when you're playing with your kid, or like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what I see. would be your personal example of it then? My personal example, let me give you one example of it. Uh, let me give you a real life example. My personal definition of serenity in my life probably was when my son was probably about nine months, eight to nine months, me, my wife, my uncle, my father, um, and my son, we all went to uh, Mexico. We went to Cancun. And we stayed at the same resort where me and my wife got married at. And me and my wife are sitting out with my son in a cabana, and he's drinking milk. She's she's in the pool or just chilling, and I'm watching, and it just feels peaceful. And so my definition of that would be just with them. Every, with all everything that I want, like, the, the, the money, the, uh, the, the, the peace, the health, um, the friends, all of those things encompass my own personal level of serenity, if that makes sense. So it's just life situations that put me in the level of peace where I'm free from everything, from everything, from outside distractions, from everything. That would be my definition. Gotcha. Uh, we got a question from Nancy. Um, what would you say or invite a person who had really invested in mastering their skills in one sport or talent, basically their dream, and then they get injured, cut, or handicapped so that their dream can never happen in that area? What makes the difference as a person? Well, they, 
Nancy, that right there is a, a great question, but here's the truth of the matter is, here's the truth of the matter, rather. The truth of the matter is, you got to figure out why you want to do achieve your dream. So once I really started peeling back the layers of the onion of my life, I realized that it wasn't football that I really was chasing. It was the money. It was the lifestyle. It was the, um, it was the freedom. And so when I realized that, I realized that I did love football, don't get me wrong, but it was the purpose behind why I was doing it. I was doing it to become free. And so once you define the definition of the purpose as to why you want that thing, because if I think back to playing football, I didn't really enjoy getting my head beat in on Sundays. I love the fame, but the sport itself is very violent. And when I played, there wasn't these, you know, no helmet, no helmet to helmet. There wasn't these protecting the quarterback. No, it was, you know, it, it was it was a tough game at the time that I was playing. So I think you've got to figure out how to navigate the passion and then also the purpose to the thing that you really truly want and then make that your next thing that you do. For me, it's it's helping people. Like that's what I have passion for. Like I have I've set a goal to impact a million people indirectly break generational curses, whether that be financially, spiritually, physically, emotionally, and then also build a legacy for my son. And legacy a lot of times means money, but that's not, I want to, I want to create a legacy of wealth from a knowledge perspective, from a health perspective, from a financial perspective for my son. So when I figured out what my real purpose was, I was able to transition that energy and emotion from football to that purpose. So that person that you're talking about has to figure out what their true purpose is. If their true purpose is to become wealthy, they don't need the sport. They don't need the sport. It just it, it fulfills that passion and that, that, that feeling inside. But ultimately, they don't need the sport. It boils down to really what they want. I see. Uh, Jay just had a comment. He goes, that affirmation board is sick. Appreciate it, Jay. Man, look, every day, man, every single day without missing because the thoughts are things. So what you focus on expands. I can't become a billionaire and help people the way that I want to if I don't focus on becoming a billionaire. I've got to see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm not close. Don't get, don't, like, I'm not going to, like, butter y'all biscuit or any of that. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I'm not close to be a, a, being a billionaire, all right? But my point is, it's on the board. It's a dream. So at some point, it has to come to its realization physically if I think about it enough. And I'm going to think, I'm a, I'm a billionaire right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just who I am, so I appreciate that. What's the So what's the difference between uh, an affirmation of, in, like in your experience, the affirmation of, okay, here's the house that I want, here's the car that I want, I already have it, telling yourself you have it, versus... You know, I'm in love with the process of getting, I'm in love with the journey. I'm enjoying each step by step in order, you know, and affirming to yourself, you know, if you're not a runner and you're taking steps, right, you're outside, you're running, you're saying, you know, I'm doing this, I'm taking each step by step, I'm going to get to the end of the block. Now I'm going to get to the, you know, and, and what's the difference between that process and then the actual end goal as an affirmation? Well, first off, the affirmation is what makes what, what puts you into action for the for, for the goal. So that's the thing that you've got to understand. So, like, if I if I'm telling myself I want a millionaire, then ultimately the universe or your subconscious is going to bring you uh, opportunities to make that happen. So, me and my wife started a real estate investment company a year ago, two years ago actually, and it's been a journey, right? So we got our first property and. Um, and we've had some challenges, but we're at the point right now where we're actually going to refi that property, put tenants in it, and start cash flow. And then we'll have a property worth probably about three hundred and sixty to three hundred seventy thousand dollars in our portfolio. But but the affirmation of wanting to get into real estate or the affirmation of wanting to become a billion a millionaire makes me act to do the thing. And it and then it's about the plan too. So once you have the goal then you get around people that help you with the plan. You know what I'm saying? So <clears throat> the affirmation helps you create the process over <clears throat> over time. Like me being an NFL player, I knew that that was my goal. And every day I told myself that I was an NFL player in middle school and high school and in college. 
And I worked my, excuse my vernacular, my ass off to make that happen. Because I knew, can you check the wings, please, babe? Okay. Because I knew for a fact, because I knew for a fact that in order for me to put the work in and love how hard it was to work hard, think about what I just said, love how hard it was to work hard. I knew that there had to be a purpose bigger than just working hard. And that purpose was the NFL. So in order for me to reach that level of success, I had to make sure that I put the work in behind just the goal. So what you think about creates your, your thought process, then creates your activity, then creates the result. Okay, and that kind of leads me to my next question is, how do you maximize your productivity? Um, and what did you learn over time about the importance of productivity? Well, that varies from person to person. But for me, if you really want the thing that you want, the activity has to be there. So maximize it is, is, is basically, if you maximizing your productivity is based on whether or not your goal is big enough, period. Like some people set goals and say they want to be a millionaire, but honestly, they don't believe that they can, they really don't believe that they can do it. So since they don't believe that they can be a millionaire, they're not going to do anything. They're not. I've been there, like, I, I have, I self-sabotage sometimes, like, you know what, I'm good. I'm going to take this nap. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so it's not a perfect formula for productivity, but the and, and some people don't really know what to do. You know what I'm saying? So you have to have a plan. Like you have to set goals. Um, you yourself, you set a goal to do certain things in your life, and you've done it. So it's like the only way that you get in, get to the process and through the process is by action. And the only way that you can do that is to really believe that you can achieve the goal that you set forth for yourself. That's the only way that you can believe. The only way that you can achieve it. Productivity, pro, productivity and activity is the most important aspect outside of your mindset into achieving the thing that you want to achieve. Um, and how important is self-improvement to team success? You, you talk about productivity, right? Uh, you know, how important is, is self-improvement for the overall bigger picture, right? Oh, my gosh. Listen. I, let's go to football terms and basketball terms right now. And Billy, Billy is going to identify with this um, himself. But here's the truth. As a, as a teammate, if you're not getting better, your team's getting worse. If I'm the star player on my team and I'm not consistently getting better, I am doing a detriment to my team. You don't have a choice but to get better when you, you're, the, you're the man or the woman. You don't. You don't have a choice. If you're not self-improving every single day and getting better, especially if you're the leader, you're putting a cap on what your team can do. If you if you've made a goal, if you've set a goal to make a hundred thousand dollars in a year, and you have people that you're mentoring and they want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year, they're not gonna make a hundred thousand dollars a year until you exceed that. They're not. Because you're your team's cap. It's, it's, it's what John Maxwell, Maxwell says in his, one of his books. It's the law of the lid. You are your team's lid. If I'm, if I'm the, the top receiver and I'm half doing stuff, then my other receivers are going to half do stuff. I'm going to be the example for them because I'm getting better every single day, which forces them because they're in the environment to get better. I like that. And especially uh, as an entrepreneur myself um, and, and relating you know, to basically to athlete terms, if if you take a day off and, you know, your employees or, or the people that you're working with see that, they, I mean, I see it all the time. It's reciprocated. Um, it It's almost like they're kind of mirroring what you do. So if you're, if you're a, a great business owner, I mean, you're going to attract great business-minded people that are going to help your business grow. So... I, it's crazy how like, I don't know, things are just kind of clicking in my head with how entrepreneurs and, and athletes are so similar um, in that respect, in a lot of respects, actually. Um, can you be successful without intention? No. No. Not, you can be successful. You can be successful. Some people can create success without working as hard as others. But you can't be successful without intentionally thinking about what you want to be successful in. No. So, if... Go ahead. 
either, either, go ahead. Um, what about, I mean, so what about those just raw talent athletes? They just come there, they're just, they're nasty, and then, you know, they don't put the work in or whatever. I mean, can could you consider that successful? Yeah. With intention? No, so, so you saying that you're saying the key word is intention. Their intent to be successful is in their mind. So that's what I'm saying to you. So a person that doesn't work hard, because I, I played with one of them, and was probably my, one of my best friends in, in the world. He was the least hardest working person I've ever met in my life. He cut corners all the time, okay? But for some odd reason, opportunity continued to fall in his lap, and before he retired, he made about $19 million guaranteed and wasn't close but here's the thing. It's not the peak. See, I want people to get this in their mind. And I'm not saying don't work hard because I had to. I was not the talent, most talented. Okay, I was very talented. So I'm not, you know, defaming myself or, or limiting myself at all. But here's what I would say. The difference between people that are successful without work ethic is their mindset and their belief in themselves. They have the intention mentally to be successful every time. So regardless if they work hard or not, my, my best friend right now is, is one of the top sales reps in uh, in a food base. It's, it's a coffee based business uh, based out of I think Jersey. He's a regional manager. I don't understand how he's so successful because he is one of the most laziest, cutting corners person I've ever met in my life. But in his mind, he believes that he is the best salesman in the world, and he consistently has success. It's the intention of being successful and the belief that one can do it. Once you believe it, it's over. It's over. It doesn't matter what your work ethic is for some people. For me, belief and work ethic has to happen. For some people, it just comes natural. So having a combination of all of that is what's going to get you really to that next level, right? Oh, absolutely. If you have the mindset and also the work ethic, you're going to cut the time down Probably you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna cut it in half as to the person that doesn't work hard and has the talent. Because talent, just having talent, there's a lot of talented people out here that are at home. There's a lot of more talented people in my neighborhood that fell victim to drugs, jail, and death because their mindset wasn't right. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have I have Anthony on here. He he just wanted to make a comment. He goes. As a teammate, if you're not getting better, the team is getting worse. And because that's money. Absolutely. <laughs> Going back Absolutely. to the um, Okay, so you already, I think you already answered this question. Who is an example in professional sports that maybe uh, didn't have as much? Oh, so I kind of, you already explained who had the raw talent that ne didn't necessarily have to work as hard. But who in professional sports, in your opinion, that has been great, um, didn't have as much raw talent, but they had incredible intention. Kobe Bryant, easily. 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 And here's why. See, what the people say about Kobe is that Kobe was um, extremely talented. He was. However, he wasn't the most talented. And because of his mindset and because of what, he, what his desire was, like his... There was a story about Kobe that um, they were playing against the Wizards. When Michael Jordan was playing playing with the Wizards, and Kobe um, went up to Mike a, uh, after the game was over, and Mike told him, "You can wear my shoes, but you'll never feel them. You'll never feel my shoes. You can wear them, but you'll never feel them." And Kobe didn't talk to any of his teammates for two weeks. The next time they played the Washington Wizards, and Mike was on the team, Kobe dropped fifty five on Mike. He had 40, 40 some odd points in the first half. And here's, my, here's what I'm saying to you is that I was not a huge Kobe fan before he retired. I got I became a huge fan after he, he did this documentary, I think it was called The Muse by, with Spike Lee. And he is the prime example. This man was working out for hours before game started by himself. And if anybody walked in the gym, my, Jay Williams walked in the gym one time and saw Kobe working. And Kobe worked until Jay Williams left. It was like two hours before the game. And after the game, Kobe had like 35. And Jay Williams came up to Kobe and said, hey, man, why, why didn't you leave the gym? Why did you work so hard? He said, because you were watching. 
because I knew that if I left before you, you got me. You got the edge over me. When people people don't understand, they really don't understand the mama mentality. Like they don't get it. And I honestly, in business, I'm developing it. I don't even. I'm not even close to what Kobe Bryant is right now. And from a business perspective. His mindset, his work ethic is second to none, and I don't believe anybody else in life will ever match it, besides me. <laughs> I like that. Um, so Jay had a comment regarding the Mamba mentality. Uh, well, he had a question, but he says Mamba mentality at the end. He goes, um, what types of, of activities or things would you and your teammates do to build uh, team chemistry and camaraderie? And then he said Mamba mentality. Uh, let, so, so here's the thing in college. So let me speak for in college because in the league it's different because you're a professional. So a lot of times, you know, the guys go their own separate ways. But in college, I was the leader. And so anytime somebody got punished, we got punished. That was a rule that I made. So um, if one of my receivers decided that they didn't want to, they wanted to break curfew or if they wanted to be late to meetings or miss practice, we had to do these things called rolls at five o'clock in the morning. And it's cold in Kentucky in the winter. I mean, I know it's not as cold as some other places where y'all live at, but it's cold in Kentucky in the winter. And we on a grass field and it's snowing or raining, and it's wet and it's muddy. And so I would have all the receivers come in at the same time with that person. And what I asked the coach to do was not necessarily punish that person, but actually make the person that did the, you know, that was late, watch this. And I mean, it was hard, bro. And so, um, what that did was it gave them a level of respect for accountability, one, because they saw it as you really going to take, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to lay on the, fall on the sword for me when I did the, I, I was the offender, but y'all all are the one that's taking accountability for me. And that hurt somebody because typically punishing the person that did it, it doesn't hurt them. But watching somebody that you really care about and love go through the thing that you should be going through, it, it hurts you. That was one thing. And then every year before camp, I would bring all the receivers in the room and I would tell them, I would say, look, the goal this year is not for me to win, it's for us to win. And at some point where you feel like you're failing, remember that I believe in you and borrow my belief in you. And then also remember that I want all of you to be better than me. And so I was able to produce out of that group um, about three or four draft picks, uh, one in which went and did more than I did in the NFL, went to the Buffalo Bills and, and had a great career, illustrious career, um, had like three or four thousand yard receiving yards. Uh, one is Randall Cobb that plays for the Texans right now. Um, that he was, he was, a, he was supposed to be a first round pick, was a second round pick and had a great career as well. So, you know, you got to be the example. The only way that you can, Build camaraderie is to be in it with the people that you're in it with. If you're not in the trenches grinding with those people, they're not going to have no respect for you. If you're not doing calls and, 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 and actually on the front line, if you're not leading them or you're trying to just be a boss to them, they're not going to listen to you. I'm a leader. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a leader. I'm going to show by example. And I'm not going to get it right every time, and I'm going to fail sometimes. But you're going to know that I'm, I'm going to be in it with you. Cool, cool. we got about, uh, let's see, maybe five or six more questions. Um, and, then, and then if you guys, if you guys have any questions, um, just keep posting them in the chat. I'll get in, I'll get to them every like one or two. Um, so what, what's bandwidth in relation to our minds like, relating back to the 5am club? I know you like that one. So bandwidth, I, I'm going to refer back to thinking grow rich. Uh, our minds are receiving stations. So, um, the one thing that our minds cannot determine is, a, is the truth. They can't determine the truth or a lie. They can't. Your subconscious mind is going to believe what you tell it. And so um, in the book, Think and Grow Richard talks about the ether. The ether is basically the mass that holds the earth in place. And it's, 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 the ether also is the, is the bandwidth that creates Wi-Fi. It's the Wi-Fi signal that computers connect to. Um, that's how you can get the connection. That's what the ether is. And so um, it basically helps you figure out if you're going to be a positive person or a negative person. Some, I'm hearing something in my kids. I just want to make sure I'm not burning out. Okay? 
So, so yeah, so um, you've got to make sure that you're into the right station. you got to make sure that your mindset is focused on the right things because the ether, because the receiving that your brain is going to do, it's going to, you, whatever you give it, you know what I'm saying? It's just like a, 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 a plant. If, if you're growing, if you're growing a, a rose and you plant a rose seed, don't think that that rose comes without thorns. You're going to get what you're going to get. It's still a rose. So don't necessarily allow yourself to um, focus on the fact that there's thorns on this beautiful flower. Focus on the fact that you're growing a rose. And the, and the thorns on the flower is negativity. The thorns on the flower is, is pessim- people being pessimistic. Thorns on the flower can be anything negative. So the bandwidth that you have mentally is one of the most important things that you got to protect. Okay, and how can bandwidth be affected negatively impact an athlete or entrepreneur? Oh my gosh, listen, we had this thing called quicksand as a quarterback when I was in high school. Once you throw one pick, it's, I was, we, we were playing a team that we hadn't beaten in like 20 years and we were up 21-7 um, my junior year in high school. And I threw one interception in the fourth quarter and ended the game with three picks, okay? And you just start seeing ghosts. It's, it's something that happens. And so one negative thought can, can turn a whole positive situation into a big mess. Mm-hmm. You've got to protect yourself from thinking negatively, man. You cannot consistently and continuously think about it. That negative bandwidth mentally can destroy you. It's like I have a friend. We're all dealing with the coronavirus, and, I, and God bless everybody, you know, and I'm hoping everybody stays safe. But I have a friend every day. His wife is a nurse, and he calls me every other day, and he is distraught when she has to go to work. And I tell him, I'm like, first and foremost, it's not a guarantee that she's going to get it, okay? But in his mind, she already got it. She, she's got it, and he's got it. But he, that's like, oh. Bro, you have to think about the positive aspects of things. Your mindset can heal cancer. Your mindset, a lot of people can have the coronavirus because they think that they don't have it. Their body will do what's necessary. Have you ever seen a person that for some odd reason they always have good luck? It's because they think that they can. I always get the the front parking spots at at Kroger or Publix every single time. I love that, man. I, I have the same mindset. Oh, because it, like, this, the, the, the coronavirus is tragic, right? But at the same token, I'm not going to let myself live in fear all the time. I'm going to be precautious. I'm going to do what, what is necessary to make sure I don't get it, but, and, and to make sure, and most importantly, that I don't, I don't spread it to anybody else if I did get it. Right. At the at the same time, you can't be stuck in this, like, you know, thinking that, okay, everything's shut down and, and poor me and get into a, a negative mindset that allows you to just keep, you know, uh, crashing down. I mean, that's really what it is. Man, listen, I'm not, I, I, I've lived in fear for a long, I lived in fear when I was playing football that my career would end because of my injury after I got hurt. And that's why my career ended. I will any day rather die. I will rather die on my feet than live on my knees. I refuse to live on my knees. I'm not going to live in fear because everybody else is. No. No. Not happening. Not happening. Um, another question from the 5 a.m. club. Uh, so I heard you follow a theory about the four interior empires. Can you explain what they are? So, let's do this, because I'm not going to explain that because I want people to read the book, okay? (laughs) But here's what I will do. I'm going to talk to you all about the power hour and why it's important to to actually read the book, but then also to implement this in your life. I've read this book probably for the last month, and I keep going back and listening to the chapters. And one thing that I don't want to rob people of is the experience of the book, okay? okay? So... The power hour is something that you learn early on in the book, which which really helps you understand the importance of getting up early. One, it takes 66 days to break a habit. See, people think it's 21 days. No, it's 66 days to break a habit. 
So here's the power hour. You get a you get you get 20 minute intervals. 20 minutes when you get up is to work out. High intensity 20 minute workout. Why? Because what that does is it it, it creates um, a level of um, happiness within yourself. I don't know the terms. I don't know the terms directly as to to what it is, but it's um and it, it's escaping me now. But essentially, it just makes you feel good. It puts you in a different mindset. Two. The second method is journaling and meditating. See, a lot of people don't visualize their day or they don't visualize their life, so they get what comes to them in their life. All right? I am not a person that believes that life happens to you. I believe that you happen to life. And if you choose to think about the thing that you want, the thing that you want is going to come to you. So that's the second thing. And then three is learning something for the next, for the last 20 minutes that make you better. See, people want to have success, but they don't want to learn the skill set. They don't want to actually practice the thing that they want, you know, by creating the knowledge and the information that they need to do it. I didn't understand real estate before me and my wife started a real estate investment company. I had no idea what to do. And in fact, I wasn't even qualified or in a position to do it. But I started listening to podcasts. I started reading that book in my 20 minute time. And I read a book. It was called Free Houses that showed me how to create wealth in real estate with no money down. Now, let me be clear. It's not necessarily no money down. It just means it's a way of trying to figure out in real estate how to borrow from somebody, put the money that you that you spent on your down payment and origination cost into the cost of the renovation and then get your down payment back. So, therefore, you really get your money back. Okay? So, the reason why I say that is because if it wasn't for the 5 a.m. club, I would have never done that. It, that would have never happened for me. You see what I'm saying? Like that would not have ever happened for me. So when that when that happened for me, when I understood what to do and how to do it, it put me in a whole different space. And I started doing more. I started I started started being intentional with my power hour. So again, work out for 20 minutes. I don't care if you run a mile, run two miles, and it takes you 20 minutes. Run it. You wanna if you wanna do it differently, you can. Two, meditate and journal. Man, my days what I want, those things, I put it in there. How I want my day to look. And then the third section of it, again, is learning about the thing that you want to accomplish. So read the book. I read the book. And I actually, give me one second. <laughs> so, guys, the uh, what he's talking about is it, it's referenced in the 5 a.m. club. Um it's called the 20-20-20 formula. So 20 minutes of exercise, 20 minutes of self-reflection and or um, what you're planning to do throughout the day. And then um, what was the last one he just said? 20 minutes of um, learning. Learning, learning. There we go. There's a packet that comes with this thing. I'm telling y'all, this is going to change your life drastically. I'm telling you. So, um, did, you I mean, write, talk, did you write, did you write the book? Huh? Did you write the book? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. We're not, no. we're not selling anything. We're not, I mean, we're just, we're having a, a good Q and a here and, um, just trying to share as much information with you guys as possible. And just, you know, with this whole coronavirus, just trying to inspire, you know, part of that is, is sharing uh, 5 a.m. club, Mr. Burton did not write it. I did not write it, <laughs> but it's a, no. it's a great book. We, we both high, highly recommend it. Absolutely. Um, is it possible to reinvent yourself, and what does that mean? Ooh, I don't know who asked that question, but that is a great question. Yes, yes. So, um, <laughs> in the 5 a.m. club now, I was talking about, because I'm, I'm, I'm actually about to wrap up the last portion of it again, but it's talking about Nelson Mandela. Okay. Nelson Mandela was in prison for over a decade. I think it was about 18 years. And, and he was treated extremely bad. And so there's trauma in life. I mean, we all go through it. There's trauma in life that we all deal with that we got to overcome. But a lot of times, a lot of that trauma holds people victim um, to their circumstance because they don't think that they can get over it. But imagine somebody being locked up for 10 plus years in a cell for something really that they probably shouldn't have been locked up for. And even if they did deserve to be in that situation, 
what that does to you. So this man gets out of that situation and becomes what the president and the leader of his community, of his country. Like, how does that happen? You, It's not by chance or luck. It's by preparation and thought process. So it is definitely possible to reinvent yourself. I had to. I'm still reinventing myself. Honestly, you know, who I am today is not remotely close to who I'm going to be tomorrow, even next week or 10 years from now. The impact that my family and myself are going to leave on this world is going to be crazy. The, the, the impact that you're going to leave, all of you on this call, that you, the potential that you have to leave, like that's, that's reinventing yourself. So you have every opportunity and in, in, in every, every ability to actually reinvent yourself the way that you want to. But you just got to believe that you can do it. Mm -hmm. That's um, it. We got another question from uh, iPad. Um, when you had a coach, leader, or teammate who you didn't click with or get along with, what would you do to maintain your mental toughness and focus on being successful? Uh, that happened my last year in St. Louis with my coach. His name was Nolan Cromwell. He's a horrible person, by the way. <laughs> but let me. Be <laughs> No, I, I don't mean that. I mean, we didn't really get along at all. Um, but I'm, he's not a horrible person. I'm not a person that can judge him like that. But here's the thing, man. Look, I, I do this for me. Like, I, I do this for me. What? I, I, you're not going to steal my joy just because I don't get along with you. And honestly, there's not a lot of people that I dislike or don't get along with. Um, if you have a problem with me, that's a you problem. That's something that you've got to deal with. The thing that you also got to deal with is watch me live my life the right way. I can't affect somebody else's decision to be and act the way that they act. The only thing that I can affect is how I act and who I am. And so to answer your question, it didn't really matter what that person was doing or if I didn't like them or not because honestly, that ain't my problem. I'm here to do a job. My job is to go out here and go to work on this football field. That's my job. And I was extremely good at my job. Everything else, it didn't matter. It's, it's, it's not important. It's not important. Uh, two more questions. We'll wrap it up. And, uh, you know, I just want to say before we end, really appreciate your time, man. I know it's valuable. I know those chicken wings are waiting for you. But uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll ask the last two questions, and then um, we'll get Sepp in. So um, from, your, from your experience and wisdom, is it too late to change careers? I know a lot of people right now, especially dealing with, you know, the coronavirus and, and maybe they've been laid off or, you know, maybe for whatever reason they lost their job um, or, you know, maybe they're just not happy with their job, right? So is it too late to change careers? So here's what I would say. One, no. And here's why I'll say that. The one of Probably the, one of the wealthiest men in, men in the world is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett didn't amass success until after, I believe, he was 40 or 50 years old. Okay? Let me, let me be very clear here. It's the belief level in yourself. If you think it's too late, it's too late. Facts. If you think it's not, it's not. Regardless of what you tell yourself, it's the truth. It's your truth. You know... Dallin and I decided to do this because we wanted to bring some positivity to a lot of people. That's There was nothing behind it. There was no intention behind it. We just wanted to be positive with people. We understand that there are going to be a lot of people right now that has to change their career. And so our goal right now is to get people to believe in themselves more than they believe in the thing. So the job or the career is not the thing. You're the common, you're, you're, the, you're the, the thing that affects the common denominator. You're our, you are the... Um, the value add. It's you. So if you want to change careers now, but just make sure that what you change to, you believe that you could be the best possible whatever it is in the world. One of my one of my affirmations is that I'm the best businessman in the world. That is a damn lie, but I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I believe there's a lot of things that I don't understand about business, but I believe it, and that's what I think. I'm the best businessman in the world. So. That's a roundabout answer to yes. You can. It's never too late. All right. And then the last question here, unless anybody else has um, any questions in the chat there. Um, 
Have you ever, so, I mean, you've you pretty much already answered this. Have you ever changed careers or reinvented yourself? You've done real estate, or you're doing iBoomerang. I mean, you're doing a lot of different things. Right. Um, you know, I, I guess, any more, any more insight yeah. or anything you want to add on that question? Yeah, so in the Bible, uh, uh, Jesus says you have to die to yourself daily, okay? And... The reason why I bring that up is because I reinvent myself every day, okay? I quit every business every single day. I quit being a father every day. In fact, I quit 20 minutes before this call because my son was acting so bad. I just was like, I'm done. I give up. And then I start being a father again probably the second after I quit. But the point is, you reinvent yourself every single day. Who you were yesterday cannot be the person that you are today. Like, if you haven't added value to somebody today by just telling them that you love them or reaching out to them to check on them today, that's a problem. Here's why. Because that means that you didn't impact somebody today. That means that the, what you did today, yesterday is the exact same thing that you did today. And that can't happen. And so regardless of what it is, regardless of who you are, you may not feel like you're in a successful place. So you may not feel you can add value to people. But telling somebody something positive about themselves could help them reinvent themselves tomorrow. So think about this. So, yeah, um, every day I reinvent myself. Like, I gave up on my business today. I was talking to somebody that was supposed to enroll, and they told me they didn't answer my phone. They told me no, basically. And then after I quit, two minutes later, I'm back in the saddle. It, life is life, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, life happens. you got to be better than who you were yesterday. Yeah. Well, hey, man, uh, I think that's exactly what we're trying to do today. Um, you know, just inspire people, uh, give people a different perspective on things. Um, and I think uh, what what one of my goals right now is to uh, make sure that I'm impacting people. And eventually I want to get to the point where I'm literally spending a week every single month with somebody that I love or care about and just completely changing their lives or, or doing something that's going to help them for that entire week and just dedicating my entire week to them. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to start doing this now and I really appreciate your help on it and giving people a different perspective on, you know, from, especially from a professional athlete's point of view, um, you know, how you can get to that next level, how you can be a better person, how you can create change, how you can have self-growth, all those good things. And, and you know, a lot of that comes from different books. And, you know, one of the books we recommend is 5 a.m. Club. It's a great book. Uh, also, The Miracle Morning is a great one that you, my friend, need to read. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> but um, I, I really appreciate your time, man. And um, unless anybody else has anything to say, um, Nancy said thank you thank you for your insights and time down you rock as an interviewer I don't think so but um, I, I hope to just be uh, impactful to people that's that's really what I care about uh, Billy says thank you both for your time and insight Jay says um, thank you for your time Mr. Burton great insight um, so just just really appreciate you man I'm, I'm so happy that you're you're one of my mentors and uh, let's continue to grow Let's do it, man. You, you got some great things ahead of you, and I'm proud of you, man. And, and what I will leave everybody with this is, um, I said this last week, but be your own hero. I know a lot of people are hurting right now, and you know a lot of people are trying to figure out what's next. Everybody just step back, take a deep breath, and, and believe in yourself for one second, and, and you'll, surprise, you'll surprise your own self. Cool, man. Thank you. No problem, man. All right, let me know if you need anything. Thank y'all so much for your time. God bless y'all. Okay. Well, that was the uh, interview with Mr. Keenan Burton and Ms. and Dallin Escobar as the interviewer. And um, kind of an impromptu thing, We, but... Um, yeah, this is uh, some great information. I learned a lot, a lot of Mr. Keenan, uh, Mr. Burton's insights and some of the, a lot of his tips. I asked him a few good questions. And uh, so if you like this kind of content, if you like um, these types of tips, 
Give me a thumbs up, a subscribe. Um, let's go ahead, go ahead and uh, comment down below if you have any questions or if you have uh, any comments you want to leave based on maybe an expounding thought or anything. And the really whole goal of this is just to provide some value and um, just help you out in your life if you're struggling with anything and uh, if you need some help with mental clarity or anything like that. So the, I think these tips and this insight will really help a lot of people. And a lot of people I build, I know are going to be pivoting to online types of businesses, people building businesses, multi-level marketing types of businesses. So um, if you are interested in an opportunity, um, I'm going to go ahead and leave the link below to uh, our presentation. So go ahead and click that link. If you'd like to join our team, you can go ahead and I'm going to put the link down in the description as well. Other than that, uh, love you all. And let's always learn, grow, and always push forward no matter what. And let's go out there and kill it. Let's spread the love, spread the giving, and let's go out there and prosper. Take care. See you in the next video.